by Tyler Pitchford. Hooray. Thank you, thank you. All right, we'll get started. It's my second ShmooCon. Oh, excellent as always. So the cloud, everybody heard of the cloud? Anybody? Nobody? Wow. It's very close to virtualization. It, it's very, what, is, what is a mainframe? I've, I've never heard of these devices. So I do have to do a short disclaimer just because I actually have a bar license. Um, the general gist of it, you can read it if you want to, is I'm an attorney. I'm just not your attorney, unless you want to hire me, which is cool. Uh, but if not, that's cool too, because I don't really need more work. Way too much work. I deal with cloud stuff now. Um, I'm actually an appellate attorney, I should qualify. I, I do appeals, not trial work. But I also was a software developer. If you want to read more, it was in my bio. I used to write some stuff called BitTorrent. You might have heard of it. It was cool. The cloud causes some problems. And we'll, we'll actually talk about the MPAA, which is one of my favorite, wait, not favorite things. So we'll get there. This is what we're going to cover. It's very, I always like to have an opener. Uh, we're going to go through a complex set of everything. And it's really boring. But we're going to make it fun, or at least we're going to try. We're going to do our best, or I'm going to do my best. You guys can have fun or not. Uh, we're going to go through the cloud very quickly. Everybody should seriously know what the cloud is, I hope, or roughly what people define it as. We're going to go through property and privacy, uh, which hopefully is what you guys care about, I'm guessing. Do we have anybody who uses the cloud, the, the mystical cloud? Does, it, does anybody have any private data? Anybody? Was, was anybody in a aesthetics talk? I mean, come on. That's fine. You can keep all my private data. Uh, property. Does anybody own anything? Anybody? I mean, I live in a rock, so it's cool. But I don't really own the rock, but it's fine. Um, that's going to be our main focus is honestly like how we protect your world. And then the law. That's, that's mostly the boring part. It's really, it is. There are caveats, sub-caveats, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to try to go from a high level, but try to make sense of it. I mean, we can go low level if you want, but I'm not going to start quoting statutes and cases because unless you guys are law students or lawyers or judges, it probably doesn't really matter. The honest truth is the reality of the situation. And we can get into big ideological versus reality conversations, and you guys can throw as many schmoo balls as you want. That's cool, but we're going to avoid that. Um, I'm going to try to stick with reality. It, it's, it's tough for me, but I'll try. Um, then we're going to talk about mitigation. I won't call it solutions. I won't call it answers. I won't call it anything. It's, it's much like any computer security topic. You can't really fix it. You can just prepare for it, right? You can, you can take ways to mitigate it, but you may or may not actually get there. And then if you guys have questions and we've got time, more than happy to answer any and everything. So the cloud. We started off, can somebody help me define it? Like, what, what do you think the cloud is? What do you, what do you define it as? Offsite storage. Off storage. Anybody else? Interconnecting tubes, <laughs> the, uh, the interwebs at large. Um, <laughs> Nimbus, outsourced IT. Roughly, uh, many people define it as uh, loosely defined as services, both software and hardware, delivered over a network. A series of tubes can be substituted for network just as easily. I am waiting for the first statute to use the cloud because I want to see what Congress decides the cloud is. I, I hope they use, like, Serial Nimbus or something ridiculous. I don't know why. It'll just be fun. Um, but for our purposes, it's going to be market speak for shared resources. Uh, that's really what it is for resource and cost sharing. Major purposes of using the cloud is because, one, you only have a little bit of money and you don't want to hire full IT staff, but you still need a server. You've got a large server and you want to sell some of that space to somebody else because you want to maximize your returns. You've got all of these grand ideas, but not a lot of money, right? Or you've got a lot of money, but you've got even grander ideas. That's roughly where we're going to be going. The problem is, is sharing a server is kind of like sharing your bed. You have to be really careful who you let into it, or you might catch something. That's, that's roughly where we're going here, OK? That's, that's the overall framework. We can put it in real, real quantifiable things for, for most people. Advantages of the cloud. Anybody? Cost referral mitigation, outsourcing IT, hopefully lower costs. You get to go into business meetings and say cool things like the cloud, synergy, whatever else. Might get a promotion. Accessibility, yeah, usually redundancy, uptime, theoretically. Or, or what's the market speak? 9999992, I don't know. Uh, sorry? Offsite, you, yeah, no, it can be. And you can, can you have an internal cloud? 
Anybody? Can you have internal virtualization, right? You can have a private cloud. Disadvantages? Well, we'll go over that, won't we? There's some good parts, but you've got to be careful with it, right? So here's the shortcut. I try, to, I try to summarize everything so we can get to it and you can take away something easily from all of my gibber um, shortcut. It's an excellent way to maximize your resources, but it is filled with potential legal pitfalls. The larger your operation, the more hassles you're going to face. Anybody ever heard the old, the old adage, you know, the more money you got, the more people want? It's roughly the same with the cloud. The bigger you get, the more problems you're going to end up with. And there's uh, some reasons for that. Usually the larger you get, the more compliance rules you have to come with, the more contracts you're dealing with, yada, yada, yada. The bigger an outage is. Every time Amazon goes down, how much do they complain they lose, what, $5 million, $6 million per hour or something? It's, it's not fun. But if you're a small company, you're, you can mitigate easily, right? Like, oh, and we'll actually talk about a fun small company later. Um, the real world examples are, are entertaining. So this is probably the meat of what you guys care about, your property and your privacy, right? And, and we won't debate whether they're interlinked or co-linked. They're just going to be property and privacy is our framework here. Property, things like your servers, your websites, your data, your business, and probably most importantly, your money. There's a lot of things that people don't consider that can happen when you put something into the cloud where you can get stuck holding the bag for a lot of expenses and you didn't even do anything. Um, I've had several clients where that's happened to, and it's not fun to watch. Small businesses, a $50,000 check is expensive. It's very tough to fight. Um, and then your privacy, wait, other property. What other property do we have, anybody? Networking gear, information, intellectual property, if, if you believe in it. <laughs> um, privacy, your data, your, your real name uh, from the last talk if you want. Scott Moulton's private trade secrets. Amy's, Amy's phone number, which I've got. Sorry, Scott. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> oh, I, I, I am happily married, I should say. No. Nah. Um, <laughs> that's for my wife so she doesn't kill me later? No. So, like, like my wife, there's something private, right? Your, um, your competitive edge, which we were just talking about, right? Your data. So, who, who runs a small company? I'm sure someone here does. Right, several people. If somebody took all of your data, Sky, would you be happy about it? No. No. It, w would you be happy if they had your bank number? No. Okay. And if you got sued, would you be happy if they had all of your correspondence with your attorney? All right then. These are some of the things we're going to deal with shortly, and how you can try to keep it away. The obvious answer, I, I better hear it right now, is. Don't put it in the cloud. Well, that's the simple solution. But if you're going to stick it in the cloud, the next is. All right, now, now I can leave, because uh, that's good. You guys are intelligent, everybody's informed. But there, there are some other things you can do. But encryption, obviously, is your best one, and we're going to cover that. The, the tough part in this talk is empirically you, you all know what you need to be doing. The problem is actually getting it done. That's the hard part, usually. Um, so the forest, this is, this is where the tough part in legal talks come. So I speak to you know, computer security conferences, I speak to software developers, I speak to attorneys. And it's easy to pin it to everybody, you know, when you've got a small niche, but when you've got a large general crowd, it's harder to, to explain everything to everyone. So we have to have some kind of breakdowns, right? So this is your overall framework, right? We're concerned about minimizing the entanglements of your property and privacy, but we do need to understand there are threat vectors, right? We need, to, we need to understand what they are. And under that guise, we're going to be looking at the laws that subject you or can subject you, or the ways that the laws can be utilized to end you up in lawsuits, roughly. So bear with me for just a few minutes, please, and uh, we'll get through the law. And I should say, I don't know how many of you see me talk before I, I see some faces, but feel free to ask questions while I'm going. I'll try to repeat them so it gets recorded. But um, you are more than welcome to ask me as I go. It does not cause me problems. The law. Who likes the law? The definitive article, the law. I'm, I'm sorry. When it works in your favor, that's my favorite. I plead the fifth. No. Um, who likes laws, actual laws, like specific laws? Which law do you like? The red light cameras? Sir, I'm sorry, that's horrible. <laughs> you, you have to, apparently in Kennesaw, Georgia, you have to own a gun. Second Amendment? Anyone? Anyone? All righty. Murphy's Law is a perfectly fine law. Congress has not codified that one yet, but they seem to use it quite often. Bada bing. Oh, the Capitol's right there, isn't it? That's awesome, man. I don't know that one. The amount of time you have to kill the project. The amount of time, you know. 
I always at work I always use my my work will rise to the level of my incompetence, which is my favorite. Work is it's not work's favorite though. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, the Peter principle. No, exactly. Legal threats. So here here is the context of where they can arise. You've got criminal first party. Anybody been involved in one of those? You don't actually have to raise your hand, but just think about it. I know there's some out there. Just just scream if it's fun or not. No. Okay, perfect. No, I guarantee you they're not fun. Criminal third party. So that's when someone else is being put under investigation and somehow you've been dragged into it. And when I say related entity, I'm not talking about your cousin or your aunt. I'm talking about someone or something you may or may not have voluntarily or involuntarily associated with. If you've got something, they might want it, a.k.a. the government, they, the man. Yeah, it sucks horribly, and we'll talk about that shortly, actually. The real-world examples are the fun parts here. So civil first party, who's been sued before? That one you can actually raise your hands. Is it fun? No. Did you have fun? Did you have fun with your attorney? Was he a cool guy? Girl? No, not at all. Boring? Long beard? No, you didn't go to trial. Good, you settled. That's, that's the normal way, right? Anybody else? Anybody else actually go to trial? Anybody? Juries? Are they smart? Not smart? Do you trust them? Not trust them? Jury of your peers? You guys walk in with cool shirts, like, you know, in binary, and they're like, oh, man, that's hilarious. And you're like, no, no, that's not. It tells you to go fuck yourself. <laughs> no, yeah, like, I actually have a tie that says, you know, go fuck yourself in binary, and the office hasn't figured it out yet, so it's pretty cool. <laughs> but it's all right, right? So the Constitution, this is what I've talked on before. I, I picked the whole circuit before. Anybody ever read it? Anybody? Yeah. Wow, wow, that is more people who've ever read the Constitution than all of Florida. Um, <laughs> Which is good, it's good. We got more sunshine, but you know, you guys are clearly more educated, I'll give you that. Um, so the Fourth Amendment, I'm not gonna read it out. Everybody know, we're gonna go through two parts of it. These are the important parts for our talk here. I'm gonna break it down. You've got the reasonableness clause, you've got the warrant clause. Anybody have a warrant issue for your arrest? Didn't show for jury duty? Like, oh, how could you, jury, civic duty, $7 a day, blah, blah, blah. Warrants, anybody? Not pay parking tickets? Oh, nobody wants to, be, oh, we got one warrant in the back. Was it, was it a good warrant or a bad warrant? No, it was not fun. Did you, get, you, you get to learn what handcuffs were? Those are horrible. So you've got the reasonableness clause. So the, the, key, the key in this whole thing right there is unreasonable searches and seizures, right? Now, who gets to decide what's reasonable and unreasonable? The man. Yeah, it's roughly the man. We'll just go with the whole body of the man. So, you know, AKA you got the, uh, the administrative side, the police or whatever, and then you've got the courts are like, well, that was quite reasonable or not reasonable. Generally, who gets the benefit of the doubt? No, it's equal footing. No, it's actually the man. That's you're right. <laughs> Just let's be honest about it. I mean, come on. We're we're in D.C. Everybody tells the truth here. But um, <laughs> I take I take the fifth. But um, no. And then you've got the warrant clause. When you get a warrant issued, well, frankly, you're fucked. Okay, that's just that's it. Like, you can try to quash the warrant and have fun, and then you got to spend a lot of money. Where's my? Who spent a lot of money on a lawsuit? Somebody. There, yeah, if you try to quash a warrant or a subpoena, which we'll talk about, it's gonna cost you, it is, it's just, time is expensive and law school is too. That's really the problem here, right? So, expectation of privacy. This is, this is the framework. This is where the courts decide whether something was private or not. So you can't, you know, search and seizure, your Fourth Amendment rights only apply when you have a, quote, expectation of privacy, a reasonable expectation of privacy. It's, it was a case called Cats, anybody ever read it? All right, yeah, Amy, of course, she's, she's an attorney, I should qualify. Anybody who wasn't an attorney read it? No. No? Well, we got a few in the back. Okay, we got some over here. Good, good. It's actually a pretty interesting case. deals with, uh, you've read it? Did you enjoy it? No, the moose read it. Yes. Shmoo Moose has read cats. Actually, probably has. I wouldn't doubt it. But the, uh, it's, the fun part about cases, always read the facts. Uh, Justice Thomas... I guess he's over one of these ways here somewhere. He doesn't read the fact sections. He says they're useless, which I always think is funny. But I, I love reading the facts. That's the best part of my job is I'm like, wow, why would people do that? Um, or, ooh, ooh, someone clearly didn't know what true crypt was. Whoops. <laughs> but, but you've got this expectation of privacy, right? If I'm, if I'm running around up right now, do I have an expectation of privacy? What do you guys think? Like, what I say now, can it? Or do I have a Fourth Amendment right in that? No, okay. Now, if I, somebody walks up and I whisper it to them, what do you think? Yes. Okay, now, do I have it in the whispering or to what I said to them? Do they, can they give up what I said or can I assert it against them? Are they married? Well, privilege, right? There's privileges, right? If it's my attorney, does that change it? Yeah, of course. There's all these privileges. If it's a priest, it depends on the state. Go figure, right? <laughs> Fun, huh? 
But um, we're not going to talk about any of that. Well, we'll talk about privilege a little, but not a whole lot. So you've got the subjective expectation of privacy. That's, do I think it's private? You know, and, and in Kat's case, he was in a phone booth and he was placing bets. I think it was in Boston and I think it was Boston, Miami or something. And the government attached a listening device to the, uh, the, the booth and they recorded his conversation, right? Which is pretty funny. Uh, it was in the Keystone Cop kind of way. But it, they record it and they you know, took it up to court, blah, 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 blah. And the court said, well, he's in a phone booth and he was placing a phone call. But he, he didn't expect anybody to listen to it. He was in a phone booth. He closed the door and he thought he was going to be there, right? So he goes out and the court says, you know, he had a subjective expectation of privacy. And then you've got an objective expectation of privacy and they're both involved in the CATS test. Objective is, does society think it's private or not? Now, right now, does society think I'm being private? No. no. Okay, what, what would something that is private? Texting. Texting. You expect it not to go anywhere, right? What about Facebook? Are we getting a little more gray? Are we, are we private? Twitter? Twitter? No, maybe, maybe not. Well, it's actually been litigated, but we'll talk about it. So, so what if I, what about Gmail? You know, is it private, not private? What do you think? Ah, well, 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 someone said, someone brought up the SCA, which we'll cover in a minute, but yeah, there, there is actually this weird quirky law talking about if it's been there for 180 days or less, or if it's been open or not. We're not going to really go into that much detail, but it is fun to know that that's how your email is decided is private or not. But, um, so objective is, does society think it's private? If society doesn't think so, you get nothing. Well, you can still have some protections, but for our purposes, nothing. General rule, if it's not private, it's not protected. Simple enough? Third party doctrine. Here's where it gets fun. So, if you reveal information to a third party, aka you give something to them, then it undermines your protections. Now there's fights on how much it undermines versus what it doesn't, yada yada, and that's always litigated, but if you share it, you lose protection. That's general framework here, okay? Now, it's always fun to think, like I always, you know, I like protocols a lot, I get a big kick out of it. So HTTP, right, you send an authenticated password to someone. Now, typically if you have a password, right, Fifth Amendment, right, search these are, there's our, um, duty disclosed, right, self-incrimination. Now, if I've sent a password to a website, which I thought was private and whatever, have, have I disclosed it? What if it was under HTTPS? Whoa, this gets fun. So everybody use, who uses webmail? Wow, you guys are fucked. <laughs> who, who uses their own pop server? Man, IMAP's better, but that's cool. No, um, no, it's, it's, it's an interesting, like these are, th the society keeps growing, right? Do you guys, who, who used a BBS, anybody? Yeah, all right, God help me, I love it. You know, the problem is I, I teach a lot of students, I still teach classes on reverse engineering and whatnot, and most of my students are like, what's well, a modem? I'm like, oh, God help me. Like, when you have to wait for the damn website to load live my line, that's, you know, that's pride. Like, you're just like, Yahoo, this is great. Like, you know, then Google came around, and you're like, man, there's only one image, what is this? Whoa. And, I think that's why they don't have any concept of why we hate Flash so much, or I hate Flash so much. It's just like, if you had to do this on 1200 baud, you would shit yourself. Like, <laughs> like you would. You just like, you would, right? No. <laughs> but, but the point is there, sorry. I digress, as they say. BBS days, right? It used to be point A to point B. It used to go from one to the other. You kind of knew the sysop, maybe, maybe didn't. Long distance calls were really expensive for if you were 10 or 12 at the time. So you didn't, unless you wanted to get your ass whooped by, you know, running up the phone bill. You called locally. You probably knew the person on the other end. But now you've got, you know, like Aesthetic was saying, you've got Eric Schmidt deciding, you know, your privacy. Is that, you like that? Anybody? Like, no? Yeah, you happy? You work for Google? No. Are you sure? Okay. I mean, it's, it's, you can admit it. It's cool. No. So, third party doctrine. Essentially, if you share it, you lose it. Does that make sense? Everybody understand why, at least, you know, if, if I'm, hey, I'm going to kill that guy. It's, you shouldn't tell people that. It's, it's not okay. It's just good general advice, like internal voice. You know, that's, that's the overall lesson here, right? You're like, shh, breathe. Then you've got this other one. What comes after the Fourth Amendment? Does anybody know? Fifth Amendment. You guys can count. <laughs> this, this is the important part. There's more to it, actually. Hopefully you recognize that. But these, these are the two clauses we're going to talk about. Quick overview. Boom. Due process clause. Anybody like due process? Well, not when you're suing somebody you hate it, the other side defending themselves. What a bunch of jerks. Um, I like the concept, of course, I don't see it very often. Whoa, Adrian. Uh, is the TSA here? Anyone? <laughs> Adrian. Everybody know Iron Geek? He's a really, really good guy. Um, and you've got the takings clause. Who likes taking stuff? Come on, you guys are hackers, goddammit. 
Come on, come on. Do you guys remember the first time you like popped past a secured area and you're like, oh man, that's great. I can't believe they only used an if switch. Anyone? Anyone? E9? E9 jump? No one? Assembler? God damn you people. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> The inner voice is good, good. Yes, yes. You have learned. Finally, I've, I've, I've reached somebody. It's, it's clearly not myself. Uh, I've never used bait patching. Bad. No. Um, takings clauses, right? Yes. Sure. Oh, oh, shit. A legitimate question. So patent law, my understanding is that the U.S. government can appropriate patents here in theory as opposed to take property. Well, there's the just compensation. They can take anything they want. They just got to pay you for it, usually. Now, now, does anybody ever dealt with the whole venue issue? Anyone actually had that? Not venue, I'm sorry. Um, zoning? Zoning? Well, eminent domain zoning. Anybody ever dealt with that? Yeah, that's, not, that's a fun one where they didn't take anything. You just can't use it for what you wanted to, right? And that's, that's kind of where we're going to go shortly. You'll see. It's, it's kind of fun when we get to the examples here. But everybody, you got due process, right, which is your right to have a procedural hearing. Yes? Well, there's a whole other talk I gave on that not too long ago, and I can refer to the video on the fourth and fifth procedure of your laptops. Actually, it's MOOCon 2009. Um, but it's roughly the border exception clause, which is the government has prevailing uh, rights to protect its border, and when you exit or enter the border, you lose your protections. It's roughly, I mean, that's the quick, quick answer. If you're, if, and if you get, they have a border zone, right? So it's not just the border, but it's where it is, and somehow it's 100 miles, which is, what, 80% of the population or something? So give me, give me your fucking phones now. Like right here, <laughs> like right, and I'm not paying you for it either because it's the border. International, I'm sorry. Oh no, that's that's the border. I mean, it's anywhere that somebody's interacting in the country, or could or could have, or within the distance of. Oh, oh, he he was asking if that includes international airports. Yes, yes. Uh, the general advice on that talk was if you're going to cross a border, make sure you don't want what you got, or you don't have anything important on there. Well, if you encrypt it, they can still mirror it and take it from you and keep it for a reasonable length of time. But if you just make sure you, you're, not, you're not bonded to it. If it's the one, your laptop your wife gave you and said she'll divorce you, if you come through without it, don't bring that one. Very seriously. And pops. Well, you, you can... No, no, uh, he, he was wondering if you have a self-destructing USB key, what goes on then. We're, we're getting slightly off topic here. But, <laughs> but, I do, I do love a good thought experiment. No, um, you have a right to your property, however, if you know, I would, I, would, I would suspect you would catch a case for an obstruction of justice, though I think you could probably defend on it. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Inner voice now. Um, so shortcut, oh, whoops, hold on, oh, two slides are out of order. Sorry, I'll fix that before I submit them. ECPA, who knows it? I know some of you out there do, because someone mentioned it. ECPA, Electronic per Communications Protection Act. So you got three titles. We're not going to go into them unless you really want to, because it gets into a big mess of when and when you can't collect your emails, which this isn't really about your emails. It's more on the broad topic of if you're running stuff in the cloud, what happens. Uh, emails, if you, if you submit it to a third party with emails, what do you guys think happens? It's just rough rule. You you know, expect somebody to read them, right? They, it's at work. You don't send something dumb at work like, my boss is a complete and utter bastard. You know, they, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Well, we do send it, and then we don't have jobs, right? So the Wiretap Act, that is for communications and transmission, a.k.a. I'm talking to somebody or I'm sending something to someone while it's in transit. Think about it, sending a letter in the mail, it's while it's being mailed, okay? Stored Communications Act, that's stored communications. That's when it's received by somebody and it's kept there. And then you got the Pen Register Act. Anybody know what a pen register is? Do we have any old AT&T goons here? Yeah, right. So you had the old pen registers, and that used to record your numbers, right? And that's roughly, think of it as the address on an envelope, okay? You write it on there. Now, is a postman allowed to look at that address and go, oh, he sent a letter to the EFF. He must be a hacker, right? So is your, are you protected by what you wrote on the outside? You guys think you have protection in that? Is that private? No, it's on the outside, right? And plain view doctrine, all that fun stuff. But these are your general statutes, right? So think about it. You got stuff in communicate, stuff in transit, stuff received, and stuff on the outside of the package. Okay, that's it's your rough physical analogies. 
Beyond statutes, this is probably where most of you are going to run into trouble, hopefully not in criminal situations, but there we go. Discovery. Who's been in a deposition? I know someone has. Oh, yeah. Did you, I do have, I, this is my favorite part about depositions. I love it. The main objection, Amy, is <laughs> form. <laughs> if you're ever in a deposition, you'll always hear an attorney go, objection, form. That just means somebody asked a question that's really bad for the case. So, has anybody, anybody heard that a whole bunch of times at your depo? Man, those must have been boring. No. Um, then you've got subpoenas. Who's been subpoenaed? Someone had. They said it wasn't fun earlier. Yeah, you get a, has anybody ever had a subpoena, Ducey's Tecum? Anybody know what that means? It means produce. You have to produce documents. So a normal, a normal subpoena is to show up and, you know, you're, you're going to give testimony. A subpoena ducis tecum is to hand over documents, roughly. Okay? And you've got first party, third party. Same thing as the criminal context we talked about earlier, or criminal and civil context. First party is a subpoena sent to you for something you have. Uh, in your case, third party subpoena is sending to a third party, someone not a party to the case, but they have some kind of information that should be, quote, discoverable or reasonably related. And then you've got other considerations in this is data preservation and spoliation. No one in here, I hope, has ever had a spoliation count against them. It's not fun. Anyone work for a larger corporation? You don't actually have to admit it, but if you do, your uh, legal department probably it, it has a lot of talks with you about e-discovery and spoliation requests and data holds. You have a question? Oh, you, you, no, no, that's a, you'll, you'll hear lots about that. And it's really boring and really tough to do, and it gets expensive, and that's part of the problem we're going to talk about. Cost of compliance is exactly that. Subpoena Zussi Tecum, we already just talked about this for a second. This roughly is a request for documents. If there isn't a privilege or there isn't a substantial burden, the documents are going to get turned over. You can move to quash, but it's expensive. It is. It just is. I mean, you can get it done relatively cheaply, but for a smaller corporation or a regular person, it's not cheap. Um, and the, the biggest point on this, and it's not well explained out, but on the shortcut is don't expect others to fight to uh, do your fight. Twitter on occasion and a couple other companies, Google I think has stepped in on occasion and said, well, we don't want to produce these documents, we don't feel like it. Usually it's for their own selfish reasons, it's just too expensive or they don't want to dig it up or they don't want to do it. It's usually not because they love you and want to give you a hug. It's, I mean, they might, I don't know, maybe 4chan wants to give you a hug, I, I don't know. Um, sometimes, sometimes it is ideological, most of the times it's just because it's cheaper to fight it than it is to produce it or it delays it long enough for them to get it turned around. Don't expect it to happen, though. User agreements. Everybody loves these, right? You guys have so much fun clicking through them. I mean, everybody does. Um, anyone ever read the EULAs? Anyone? No, nah, I didn't think so. Oh, whoa, whoa. You guys have way too much time. Uh, can I have your urgent? Yeah. Oh, well, you can pay me to do that. Uh, I, don't, I don't even like reading them. Uh, they're actually, some of them are entertaining. I love the uh, mistakes in them. It's always fun. But the, um, it's, it's roughly an agreement between yourself and a third party with quotes on the end that you don't actually read. Um, but the problem is, is that these can define and possibly waive your expectation of privacy. And this has come up in several cases uh, recently. It's, it's more and more common. And we'll go through one, but there are more. Um, one of the big decisions on whether email, the SCA's requirement that they could turn over email without a warrant through a subpoena, one of the discussions was whether or not the user agreement played a light, uh, uh, removed the pr uh, privacy interest. Um, which they decided in that case it didn't, but they said we won't constrain ourselves to saying that it never could. So essentially if you're like, yeah, Google, read anything you want to direct ads at me, you may have waived everything. So be careful, always read the fine print, because we like to write a lot of it. It's just fun. Um, yeah, yeah, usually it's in lovely legalese, um, which is just this whole world of fun. That's actually why we go to law school, is just to learn legalese. That's, it's not... No, no, but that's the problem is understand the fine print. If you don't like it, the corollary is don't use it. I mean, it's, it's never fun, you know. The, the fine print is usually drafted from, from our standpoint or a business standpoint of there's so many things that we can get in trouble for, we just don't want to. Um, on your flip side, you get use, general 99.9% .9 of people just don't care because um, they don't ever expect it to become a problem and then you catch a case and then it's a major issue, right? Not fun. Uh, contracts and compliance. Someone, big corporation. Do you have a lot of compliance requirements? Do you have a, do you have a lot of compliance requirements? Yes. Yes. Can you, can you state your industry? Education. Ah, education. I wish I had one of those. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, medical, anyone deal with medical records? 
That's a hot nightmare. Um, anybody deal with the stock markets? That's fun. I worked in a brokerage firm for a while, writing their accounting packages. Woo, that was good. Um, God knows what happened to that data. But um, the problem with these are they may subject you to privacy and compliance requirements. It's impermissible data disclosures are a big problem. If you've disclosed data that you contractually agreed not to, you have what? Yes, yeah, so you have liability, you have breached a contract. Not fun. So make sure it's worded carefully. So let's get back to it, right? There's a lot of things that can go wrong. All of these things can pop up and cause you a problem. Just assume, for general purposes, you can and will have a problem. That's my general theory. So let's go through it. These are the fun ones, right? Twitter is the devil, right? Anybody? No, do you guys love Twitter? I'm sorry. I don't. I've got a friend who's a journalist, and I swear all he does is tweet to his other friends that are journalists who tweet back to him. I, I haven't figured it out, but it's very interesting. So here's the background on the Malcolm Harris case. It's um, Occupy Wall Street. Anybody remember that? It's this little, little thing that happened. Aesthetics was probably there. I don't remember. Um, roughly, someone, he, uh, there was a, I believe it was a criminal mischief charge. New York subpoenaed the Twitter, subpoenaed the Twitter, subpoenaed Twitter for uh, account information in the tweets. They didn't just want the transactional data, aka the pen register stuff. They wanted the context, which comes into the Stored, Compliant, the Stored Communications Act, SCA. The plaintiff moved to quash. He's like, oh man, I really shouldn't have tweeted, man. I punched that cop or whatever it was. I, I honestly don't know what the tweet said. Um, plaintiff's arguments were it was protected by the Fourth Amendment. I don't want to give this up. It's private. The government said there was no expectation of privacy and the information went to Twitter. Who do you think wins? Oh man, it's always the government. This plot line sucks. <laughs> yeah, or the business. Yeah. Who wrote this script? Oh man, it was J.J. Abrams. I'm now going to be sued. <laughs> the court said no reasonable expectation of privacy under the third party doctrine, and they used Twitter's user agreement, which basically said you agree to give Twitter a license to use it for any and all purposes, whatever, we'll send it to the world. There was actually some, some line about we're going to broadcast this to the world or something like that. If that's in the user agreement, it's not private, okay? If, if you've given a license to someone to show it to anybody and everybody everywhere, you're probably not going to win under the Fourth Amendment. That's just the quick rule here, right? And, and then the judge, because he, he, there's this whole jurisdictional thing, which I really don't want to get into, but we can, about federal government supremacy, yada, yada, yada. Um, the SCA, which is the Story Communications Act, the judge said that the subpoena complied with the, the technical requirements of the SCA. In result, it got turned over, the information. Twitter actually tried to fight it on his behalf, on Malcolm Harris's. So the judge uh, denied the quashing. Uh, Twitter got the uh, subpoena sent to him. Twitter said, no, we don't want to do this. The judge ignored it. You know, denied that to issued, uh, Twitter finally complied. Um, so Twitter objected, ultimately complied. And then um, Malcolm ended up pleading guilty just recently, the last I heard. Um, but the word is they plan to appeal the subpoena. So we'll, we'll find out what goes on there. I'm guessing it'll get held up though. Um, that would be my take. Quick lessons, if you share it, you lose your rights, okay? That's, that's a simple, simple concept. And always check the fine print. Like you said, it can be hard to read, post it somewhere. Take it, put it on one of the, uh, the law blogs and say, hey, does anybody know what the hell this means? Um, make sure you don't violate a copyright, but maybe educational fair use exceptions. So I think there'd be a fair use exception if you were getting legal You probably could have a fair use if you were getting legal advice, I would think. I, I, would, I would go with that. I'd fight it. Why not? Skydog Inc. Does anybody know Skydog? He's a goon here. He runs a con called Skydog Cog in Nashville. It's, it's a fun con. It's a good dog. I always like to throw him in my talks to make fun of him. So this will be one. This is actually a real case I had. It was not Skydog Inc. It was not anything involved with Skydog. So he, he's never been arrested as far as I know. Um, at least not where I had to defend him. Um, the, the big lesson here is no good deed goes unpunished. Has, has anybody learned that? You're like, oh, you can have my Twinkie and then you find out they're diabetic. It's not cool. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a big fucking mess. Lots of ambulances. It's just nasty. Background. This is, this is fun. This is a small business who had a virtualized server and they had some unused space and some unused uh, process space and some un like huge uh, terabyte array, had some space. Were approached by a person and said, hey, I've got a business idea. You know, it's pretty, pretty good, but I, I need some server space. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not tech savvy. Anybody ever get that? Hey, can you help me set up my company? And you're like, oh, I got a server. Okay, sure. So the business rented its space to another entity and um, to run this little tiny website roughly. The, the problem is, is one of the related entities of that website ended up under a government investigation. Now, the data is being stored where? On, on Skydog Inc. servers, right? So he gets a third-party subpoena. 
if, is, if you've ever seen a third-party subpoena from the U.S. government, it's really cool. They have these really big fonts, like, you know, where it starts off like the U.S. Supreme Court case, and it's like, blah, 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 and it looks all really official, and you think you're going to get thrown in jail. It's, it's not fun. I mean, you actually see a lot of clients crying when they get these. So it's not, it's not okay, and then you read it, and you're like, oh, you're fine. It's the other guys who are screwed. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, oddly enough, makes them feel better um, until they read it again, and then they call you up, and, and, and then they get your bill, and then they cry again. But it's, it's, it's fine. <laughs> And you're like, you're fine, it's just the insurance company that's screwed. But this, this is where it gets funky, right? So they weren't under investigation, they weren't accused of any wrongdoing, but they did have materials. They had evidence that was reasonably related and discoverable. The website was isolated, it had its own virtualized server, but some data had crossed, it had passed over, it wasn't a virtualized server. Where do you think the data leaked into the main systems? Database would be a good guess, it's far more common. Logs? And, well, some of the logs, yeah, but it's mostly email. It's also the devil with Twitter. Um, because who was sending emails to him about the server and things that were going on? The website was saying, hey, I've got this guy who needs to do something, which is the related entity, it was being sent to the guy who administrated the server, so it was over email. Now you've got, and a subpoena is usually very, very broad in the sense of, we want all communications between anyone and anything doing to do with anything and everyone ever, roughly in that speak, too. When you've got emails, now, now, how many of you guys are, are data hogs? Just love to keep them. Just, just keep it forever. Yeah, man, God bless you if you get a subpoena. You're going to make an attorney a lot of money. Well, because the problem is, is do you, you get a discovery request in legalese. Are you going to have any clue what you need to turn over? No, and if you don't turn it over, what are they going to do to you? Well, you're going to try to find everything, right? Well, what you said, then give me a subpoena, I get the... Everything, yeah. <laughs> Here it goes. Well, you're going to try to mitigate it because you don't want to send them pictures of significant others in various ways, right? I mean, you're just not. I mean, you might. I don't know. I, I, I'm not going to judge anybody here. You just do what you want, right? That's a different email server, right? Yeah. You wanna, yeah. That's the problem. Commingling is bad is the general lesson here. But, so the website is like, there was no data retention plan. They didn't delete things on a cycle. They didn't say every 30 days we're going to clear things out. They had, God, what was it? It must have been decades of data. I mean, it was like 12, 15 years, I think worth of emails. It was something like 100,000 emails that had to be searched. It was a high volume, you know, uh, internet related business and, uh, business. and to go through 100,000 emails and find the, the needles in the haystack takes a lot of time. Now the fun part was they also kept all their old dead hard drives, um, which Scott probably would be glad about that, but the reality was is they had the data and they actually had to, I remember sitting there watching them plug these in while they tried to see if they worked or not and then mark them dead or alive and if they were alive they had to go through them. That was, that was great fun. Now, you can try to quash this kind of stuff, but it's usually just these, most circumstances, unless it's gonna cost you a, a fortune to drag everything up and hire people like Scott. You don't have to, you don't have to create anything when a subpoena shows up. I should qualify that. You, you only have to produce things you have. You don't have to go out and make a summary, for example. Um, but the cost of retrieving the data was expensive, and quarantining, quarantining systems was near impossible at that point. One of the problems that resulted from this was that they actually had to take an entire server, one of their, their main servers, pull it off the rack, get a duplicate, stuff it back in place, and it cost them about 20 grand just for the new server. Because it was so coming, they were just like, oh, to hell with it. You know, here, the government can have it. We don't want it. Deal with it. Give it back when you're done with it. They'll have a second server when it's done. Um, the outcomes from this, they had to hire an attorney. They produced the documents. Uh, cost them a lot of money. Uh, they shut down the machine. They had to purchase a new server, and it cost them roughly around $50,000. That was just for helping somebody out with a stupid little website. So who wants to virtualize now? Yeah, fuck off VMware. <laughs> but um, man, I'm totally gonna get sued off this one. That's a good one. But um, things to learn. Minimize the mixing of unrelated systems. It's difficult to do, it is. It's, I, I mean, I was an IT guy for years and years and years and a software developer. You just send stuff everywhere. It's, it's how it works. We're very, unless you've got a very narrow system, you are probably mixing stuff at some point, which can cause you problems. Quarantine to the extent possible. Always have a data retention plan. I know that in our industry, it's the godsend to have everything backed up as much as possible. A few backups is fine. If you get excessive, it can cause you problems when you get into discovery matters. It can, it, it will. Um, and always have an indemnification agreement. If they actually had a good agreement in place, if the contracts between everybody and the other guy had money, um, they could have gotten paid back for a lot of the expenses they took probably with a fight over the contract, but at least it's something. So liquid motors, yes? Well, if 
uh, would encryption have helped here? Um, I mean, I can think of a couple contexts where it would have probably reduced the amount they had to look for. Um, for example, Mega, Mega Upload's new system encrypts all the data so that it, they can't actually tell you what's there. So if they get a subpoena, they can say, I don't know what the hell's there. Um, I looked, didn't see anything. It, you know, it may, it, there is some plausible deniability at that point. Not, not that you have anything to deny, internal voices. Um, but liquid motors, anybody read this? Anybody know about this? Anybody remember it, 2009? It was probably one of the bigger news things in 2009. Um, rough. But if I didn't do anything, yeah, we know, but eh, whatever. Anybody, maybe it's the government, right? So it was a midnight, it's a mid-sized business. They were sharing, um, they were at a co-location facility. They had their servers stuffed in a facility, right? The owners, this is, the, this is kind of the quirk in the case. The owners of the facility were in investigation. So the government executed warrants. They, they had probable cause. They properly executed warrants. They seized everything. And the judge eventually would say it was okay, but they seized everything, just took it. They went in and cleared the whole place out. Now, this has happened. I'm sure you guys have seen this in the news. This is not the, fir this is not the first time it happened. It was the biggest one out, and then it's happened several times afterwards. What happens when they pull all your servers and the networking gear? <laughs> yeah, you get a lot of fucking phone calls, right? Like, where's my shit? Um, and nobody's happy. Nobody's happy. Uh, and you start losing what? Money. Money. You lose it to attorneys, and you lose it from your clients. Um, so what do you do? You, you first you cry, and then you. you well, yeah, if you've got insurance, that would be fine. Dis uh, disruption insurance, right? Um, you file a temporary restraining order, hoping to get your servers back. Now, Liquid Motors actually had it filed the same day. They had their servers pulled. They called their attorney. The attorney actually wrote a decent complaint, filed it the day, asking a, a, for a temporary restraining order. So the arguments were. We did nothing wrong and you don't need our servers. We're not under investigation. We're bleeding money. We're losing clients. Please give them back. The government said, yeah, well, we don't really need them. Uh, we'll, we'll give them back to you eventually, no problem. Um, but we think the guy who in the facility may have used your servers for nefarious purposes, so we're going to take a look and, and then we'll give them back to you. Now, it's kind of a quirk, right? It wasn't them actually doing anything wrong. The guy that they would co-located their facilities at was possibly using their uh, machines for, for bad things. Um, so the judge said, well, the government properly took your system because it may have evidence that's relevant, but you need to give them back within three days. Now, the, the funny part there is the government said, well, I'll give back them to them in three days. So that was, that was tough on the government, right? But, um, but first they get to image them. That's the part that always threw me off. So they, they created a forensic copy and then they turn it back. Now they've got this entire company's data who didn't do anything, right? Now there's where encryption would have helped you some because you know what's fun is having your client records in the government's hands, right? That's, that's good. Now, if they have to go investigating through the systems and they run across something that's wrong, what's the problem there? It, or wrong, I should say, not quite legal. Plain view doctrine is most likely going to apply because they had a lawful purpose to be in there. Yes, you have a question? Yeah, so the government thinks that this is a death qualify as a data breach? It's gonna depend on your contract. Uh, he asked if, uh, if the government taking the system would qualify as a data breach. Um, if you didn't take proper steps to secure it, um, I'm guessing it's going to be a jury question on whether you took enough steps and it was reasonable or not to expect the government to seize your property and go through it. That, that would be my guess of how it would work. So if the government thinks it was they did a breach of their own, their laptop or their card, are you required to then notify your client that it was a breach? Well, I think as soon as the government took it and imaged it, you'd probably have to. Uh, he asked if you'd have to notify your clients of a data breach. One, it's going to be contractual. Uh, well, I, Oh, he asked if the government would notify you if they lost the data? No. Let's, let's just be honest here. I, I would suspect not. I mean, they can't even tell me when my taxes are ready. So, <laughs> God help us all. Um, lessons learned. Even though you keep things for yourself, it can be a problem. So these guys, they didn't mingle anything except the actual physical locations, right? And they just ended up getting screwed. Physical access is the bane of all computer security, right? You know, if I can get to your machine, I can take out the uh, liquid hydrogen, freeze your memory, and then boot it back up, right? Yeah. Anybody? Jacob Applebaum? No. God help us. Um, and keep a local copy. Why? Why do you want a local copy? Oh, so if I have everything local, why do I have it in the cloud too? It's, it's not a bad thing. It's redundant, right? And now I've got two copies. I'm just paying twice as much. Here's our favorite, right? Who? <laughs> Kim.com. I swear to God, I want to fly to New Zealand and see if he'll give me a job. Like, this guy is, he just makes me giggle. Um, <laughs> it's subtitled when it all goes terribly wrong, because it's just fun. It's a great case. Um, 
really interesting, and, and this is slightly sarcastic, so don't hold me to exactly the facts, but the internet went boom. The series of tubes popped, roughly. Um, now, he had a 1,000 servers uh, leased from a company, and I, I always get the name wrong. I think it's Carpathia, Carpathia. It's, it sounds Roman or something. I don't know. They were leased in the U.S. The government pops in, and they say they, they had warrants issued. The government goes in, pulls all the servers, and their <laughs> series of the facts is they pulled them for a week and imaged them. If they imaged all uh, 1,000 of them, they said it would take 22,000 hours, which is pretty cool. That's some downtime, right? You get them back in, what, 20-something? But... Um, Hold on, I'll get your data soon. Um, but the problem is, is they, they pulled all the servers. They only imaged a few of them. They only imaged a little bit of the data. And then at the same time, they froze Mega Upload's assets. Now, if you quit paying your bills, what happens? The lights go off, right? Or your servers don't get plugged back in. And if you don't have any money, what can you do? But here's the fun part. There's a guy named Kyle Goodwin, which is interesting. Uh, anybody, EFF case, you guys reading this? Anybody read these? It's, it's interesting. It's fun. Um, he ran a small business local, uh, hosting videos of local sporting events um, for Mega Upload. And then um, his hard drive died. He went to pull the backups off of Mega Upload, and it was gone. So the responses and the arguments is my favorite part about this. Mega Uploads is essentially this is all bullshit, right? and, and they're still fighting it, which I love. Um, the service provider said it was costing them $9,000 a day to keep these servers idle, which is, you know, I cannot afford that, can anyone? Because if you can, I really want to hang out with you. Um, <laughs> Kyle Goodwin said, can I please have my data back? No, really, I want it. I'm, I want to run my business. The MPAA just pops into everything in these contexts, which is hilarious. Um, we don't object to it going back. We just want to look at it first, because there might be pirated movies. Wow. Wow. <laughs> we, we just want to take a peek. Like, wow, who the fuck are you? Um, <laughs> And then and you got the government. Well, we, we got what we want. Thanks. Appreciate it. We're done. Like, oh, and we think you may have waived his right. Oh, and there's this great footnote in one of the documents. I think it's footnote five of some filing in October 2012, where it says, we've run the MD5s, and it looks like he may have had some known hashes for pirated music that he overlaid on the videos. Now, the funny part is in all the other documents, the government keeps saying, well, we don't have his data. We can't get to it. Nobody can get to it. How the fuck did you get MD5s if you can't read the data? Like, that's, that's the missing link that I really want to know. I'm guessing uh, the only thing I could come up with is Mega Upload probably had um, an index of the files or linked to the accounts or something along those lines, and that's where they got it from. But I don't know. I just think it's interesting. So here's the outcome. It's a hot mess. It totally is. It's great. Like, th watching the filings going back and forth makes me giggle the whole time. But the, uh, the government says we released everything to the service provider. The service provider says we can't get to it. Mega Upload says we can't get it up because we can't pay our bills. And Mr. Will Goodwin good just can't get his damn data back. Like, that's, it's a Mexican standoff of epic proportions. I just love it. Um, and it, it, the legal issues are actually really interesting. That's the fun part about it. And then um, Mr. Goodwin's argument's a taking, and the government's responded, well, in the user agreement, it said that Mega Upload said that you couldn't sue them if you lost all your data, so why do you get to sue us for losing all your data? So it's more of the, the like, you couldn't get it back from them, why do you get it back from us just because we caused the problem? Interesting. <laughs> the NBAA just wants to start shit. I don't know why they're great. They're, they're just fun. Um, so the lessons, pick your provider carefully. Anything with a really trumped up word in the name, not good. Just not. It's not. It's just not. And if, and if the owner is named .com, totally cool guy. Just don't know if I want to have my data. Um, keep a local copy, but not too many. We talked about that. Read the fine print. If you can't understand it, send it to a blog or somebody else, find an attorney. Um, and check the escrow and recovery policies. If there had been a provision where this would be you know, an insurance in place, you may have been able to get the data back because someone would pay for it. So quick um, suggestions. We're going to do this quick because I want to get some questions. Encrypt, encrypt, encrypt. Implement data retention policies. Keep redundant copies. Quarantine data as much as possible. Carefully read and negotiate your user agreements. Make sure contracts don't conflict with cloud providers' policies. And sharing is bad. I don't give a fuck what they taught you. Um, that's the general rule. Questions, quick. Yeah. Yes. That's, uh, they, well, they relied on the third-party doctrine in the Fourth Amendment. I mean, that was what, what they relied on is because he passed it. Oh, I'm sorry. He asked if um, the sharing principle, the third-party doctrine, would have affected Malcolm Harris's case, uh, Malcolm Harris's case. And yes, I mean, that was one of the main holdings. Anybody else? Anyone? I will be outside if you need anything. Yes.
Um, well, check your user game. Uh, he asked what protections you should have at a data center um, where he's, he's got a server located. You own the server, I assume? Okay, he's, he owns the server in the rack. Well, one, check, make sure it's physically secured. Two, check your agreements with the, um, with the facility to make sure that it's your space. You've rented it and check your, um, uh, well, I'll talk to you in a second. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. <laughs>